I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This episode of Parallax Views is brought to you by the $10 tier and above supporters of Parallax Views on patreon.com slash parallaxviews, and those supporters get a producer's credit shout-out on each and every edition of the show. So, producer's credit shout-outs to Mark, Arlen, Spartacus, Gunner, Ed, Grass, James, Mickey, Brian, The Warner, The 42 Group, Nick, Emilia, Chase, Chris, Ork, Black Tuna, Nathan, David, Holland, Martin, Stu, Jeffrey, Thomas, Elliot, Colin, Michael, Matthew Ho, Brace, Galen, Chance, Justin, Nick W., and The Mere Project, M-E-E-R. Thank you again to all of those $10 tier and above supporters on my Patreon page. You can join them at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. It's those producers' credit supporters that can really help this show keep going, and their support is very much appreciated. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program... We're speaking with returning guest Richard Silverstein of the Tikkun Olam blog, which covers issues related to the Israeli national security state. We'll, of course, be talking a great deal in this conversation about the recent Israeli elections, which turned out to be a triumph for not only the scandal-haunted Benjamin Netanyahu, but also far-right politicians such as Itamar ben Yuver and Bezalil Smotrich. What does the far-right's ascendancy in Israel mean? What does it entail? We'll be covering all that and much more on this edition of Parallax Views with Richard Silverstein. A brief word of warning, the final few minutes of the conversation you're about to hear included some auditory glitches, I would say in the last three or four minutes, but I believe the conversation is eminently listenable, even during that portion. And now, on to the conversation. Welcome to Parallax Views, a guest that I'm very happy to be speaking with again. I think we last spoke uh, in the summer uh, with regards to events in Israel and Palestine. Um, We're going to be speaking with Richard Silverstein of the Tikkun Olam blog. I believe Richard has also written for publications uh, like Jacobin and the Middle East Eye. And I want to thank him for coming back on the show. How are you doing, Richard? Great. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, Richard, the reason I asked you to come back on the show is that we recently had elections in Israel, and it seems like this is taking up the news cycle now, uh, even in the U.S., because of uh, some gains made by the far right in the figures of Bezalel Smotrich and Itamar ben Yiver. Uh, could you please tell us uh, what's, what's the scoop on this? What is the basic outline of what has occurred? Well, this isn't, this isn't, excuse me, this isn't just a gain, uh, as you mentioned. This is a takeover, uh, excuse me, of the Israeli government, uh, of the Israeli political process by not just a far-right government, which uh, has been in power on and off since 1977, but uh, of an outright fascist government, um, which 
um, um, is even more extreme, even more hateful, even more violent than anything that's preceded. And um, I've been covering uh, an interest in this issue for 40 years. And, you know, you hear periodically as each government gets elected that this is the most right wing that's ever been in the history of, of Israel. But no, this really takes the cake. Re the reason is that not only did Netanyahu uh, win an election where he's returning from uh, uh, having lost prior elections, um, so this is a triumph, a personal triumph for Netanyahu, but also he has uh, added baggage of uh, two, uh, I would call them even Judeo-Nazi parties. Uh, you could call them Judeo-Fascist if you don't want to use that term. But um, Itamar Ben-Gvir, who you mentioned, and Bitsaleo Smotrich uh, are not only right wing, but they're actually terrorists. <laughs> Um, um, ben Gavir has been convicted actually of terror incitement by um, Israel in Israeli court. And uh, Bezalel Smotrish was actually uh, detained by the Shin Bet uh, with explosive devices in his car, which were going to be detonated. Uh, I don't think they know exactly where he was planning it, but he was protesting against the Gaza withdrawal about maybe 15 years ago. So uh, they all have a history of engaging in or promoting actual violence, uh, actually terror, actual terror attacks against Palestinians. So you have two terrorist figures who not only have gotten elected to the Knesset, but they're going to they, they, they had such an increase in their um, a number of votes that they got that they raised their uh, number of MKs from about seven to about 14 or 15. So they are probably the second most uh, powerful party in the new governing coalition, and they will demand key portfolios. Um, ben Greer is going to demand the uh, interior, the uh, public security portfolio, which is the portfolio that takes care of, that includes the police and includes settlements and includes any kind of security issue, which um, everything to do with the Palestinians is security related. So he will get to determine how Israel, how the police, how the military um, deals with Palestinians. He will get to control um, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and the access of Muslims to it, he will get to control the access of settlers to it as well. And the settlers want to provoke uh, massive violence there so they can uh, hopefully for them, they hope, uh, lead to the uh, rebuilding of the Third Temple, which is another arcane religious issue, um, but one that could explode into tremendous violence. I want to get into all of that. That's a lot to unpack, but... Um... You know, I, I wanted to address something you said earlier. Uh, a lot of people, when they heard about the election, or people at least that I know on the left, I think some people have this idea that, oh, you know, this is just going to be a continuation of the same old, same old right wing in Israel uh, that's often being criticized for its actions against uh, the Palestinians, especially by uh, activists and journalists on the left. But you're saying this time it is different. So for listeners that think, oh, this is just going to be a continuation of the same old, same old, well, why do you say this time is different? Well, um, because um, the threshold of violence is much lower now. Um, in the past, you've, either, you, you, you've had a kind of minimal level of restraint. And um, it is really military and police could engage in um, hostile extremist uh, incidents against Palestinians where they beat them or they even killed them, but it was done on a kind of piecemeal basis. Uh, now you're going to have an entire government that is going to be um, basically let loose. The police will be let loose. The military will be let loose um, to do whatever it wants. And uh, and and for example, Ben Gvir uh, goes out in public and when he confronts Palestinians. Um, he is in favor of the wholesale eradication of the Palestinian presence in East Jerusalem, which is again another uh, fire, uh, uh, you know, fire, a uh, fiery kind of uh, 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 Sorry, uh, it's a fiery issue for Palestinians because they've had a presence in East Jerusalem for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, and um, the right-wing Jews are trying to expel them 
from uh, their homes that they've lived in for generations. And um, he is a provocateur as much as he makes any sort of policy uh, statements or, or uh, engages in policy. And um, he basically wants to provoke Palestinians because he wants to either expel them from Israel, kill them, maybe convert them to Judaism if they don't, if they're not well, if they're willing to um, do that and not be expelled. Um, and and the issue of of ethnic cleansing is important here because uh, even though people outside of Israel think, oh, this is a this is a you know, bridge too far that Israel would never expel Palestinians. That's not true. They expelled a million Palestinians in 1948. So, um, and they haven't, you know, done it uh, on a, that wide a, a, a basis since then. But um, that's what these two politicians want to do. They want to get rid of the Palestinians. Either they get rid of them physically by getting rid of them, physically move them outside of Israel or push them outside of Israel, or uh, they can engage in acts of genocide. Um, so um, it's a very, very dire situation. It's not business as usual, as people may think. This government, uh, you know, many people say that if there's going to be any kind of world global conflagration, it's going to start in the Middle East. Uh, there are so many different uh, points of ignition in the Middle East, it could be any one of a number, but Israel and Palestine is one of the key ones because Palestine is not just itself and, and, and you know uh, 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 a sole kind of entity, but a Palestine reaches out to Muslim states and Arab states all over the world. So um, they are going to, with, for example, uh, the, the uh, Haram al-Sharif, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is the third holiest site in Islam. So if they want to rebuild the third temple, which the radical uh, Israeli Jews want to do, they would have to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And again, people should not think that because this has never happened before, that it won't happen. I mean, look at what happened in, in Ukraine. Nobody ever thought that Russia would uh, would mount a full-scale invasion and try to completely topple the Ukrainian government. Um, we have to anticipate that the unthinkable is thinkable, and actually, maybe um, they may try to do it. What makes these figures, I guess, um, for people that aren't familiar, what makes a figure like Smotrich or Ben Giver uh, different than even a figure like Netanyahu? Because I know Netanyahu, in, in some ways, is almost... Um, at times, like a man without an ideology, I almost feel like he's most interested in keeping power. Uh, so he'll pander to the most extreme elements, even if in some ways he thinks that makes him look bad, um, as long as it gets him votes. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, I call Netanyahu a tactician. He's excellent at um, engaging in individual acts that sort of promote his own power and promote his ability to stay in power. That's really all he cares about. He doesn't really care much about policy. He doesn't care. He doesn't look strategically at any point. So a really good politician has a vision and he may sort of compromise here and there, but he has an overall goal that he has in mind that he wants to achieve. Uh, Netanyahu has nothing of the sort. He's been in the prime minister for 15 years. Um, and the only, he, he just, um, tax whichever way the wind is blowing politically. The difference between Netanyahu and Ben Gvir and Smotrich is that these guys have an agenda. They have a very clear agenda of what they want to accomplish. And so when you have that, um, when you have that kind of ideological focus, um, then you are much more powerful than a politician like Netanyahu, because he will just go with the wind and you know he'll go back and forth if if somebody hates an idea he'll backtrack and he won't you know pursue it if the united states tells him this is a bridge too far you can't do this that um he'll say okay i won't i will uh, you know withdraw that uh, these guys are going to go 100 percent full steam ahead with the most violent the most sort of uh completely unleashed brutality and thuggishness uh, that anyone can imagine. And um, the worst 
is not only possible, but uh, very likely to happen. So you mentioned the issue of the temple. What is at stake there? Well, historically, there have been two temples uh, in Jerusalem, uh, uh, what the Israelis call the Temple Mount and what the Muslims call Haram al-Sharif. Right now, there is a mosque there that's been there for four or five hundred years, maybe more, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And uh, it's the third, as I mentioned, third holiest site in Islam after Medina and Mecca. Um, So Muslims from around the world make a pilgrimage there. Um, and Muslims in, in Palestine uh, regularly uh, worship there. And what is happening is until recently, in maybe 20, 30, 40 years, Jews basically shunned the Temple Mount because there was a Jewish prohibition on physically going up to the Temple Mount for religious reasons I won't go into. But in that last 30, 40 year interval, there's been a real major shift in um, religious or in, uh, attitudes towards that. Um, with the, um, the Israeli settlements on the West Bank, uh, which were motivated by a kind of religious messianism, believing that if Israel um, regained all of the territory that historically had been a part of it, going back to the Bible, that that would bring the Messiah. And in order to bring the Messiah, in their view, they would also have to rebuild the temple. That would be the third temple. There's a problem, though. Right now, in the space where the third temple used to be, Al-Aqsa Mosque. <clears throat> so clearly, although they don't say it explicitly, they would have to destroy the mosque. Um and this, you know, the, the religion is a powder keg in the Middle East. Um, you've got Islam, you've got uh, Judaism, you've got Christianity, you've got a bunch of other religions. And um, all it takes is one little match, um, <clears throat> lighting up uh, oil, gasoline, whatever term you want to use, um, and, and the whole thing could go up uh, in flames. You even have within Islam, you have Shiites and you have Sunni, and they also are at, are at each other's throats often. So um, very dangerous uh, flashpoint here. Another thing, because I, I want you to um, to get delve into this a little bit. I think a lot of people are trying to say, oh, you know, only 10 percent of, of voters in Israel backed, uh, you know, these really not just uh, anti-Palestinian, but also very homophobic far-right parties of Ben Giver and Smotrich. Uh, wh- how do you respond to the people that are saying, well, it, it was just 10 percent? It was just 10 percent. Well, liberal Zionists, um, who are people who believe Israel can be a Jewish and a democratic state and who have kind of espoused that view for, you know, d- decades, maybe going back to the founding of the state, Um, believe that um, all this kind of radical, extreme, violent behavior is an aberration. It doesn't really represent what Israel is, what Israel actually is, is a liberal, humane, uh, pluralistic uh, state. Um, And that's actually maybe never has been true, but certainly is no longer true. And uh, I read uh, a group in the UK called Labor Friends of Israel, associated with the Lib- with the Labour Party, um, said what you just said, and that is that only 10% of Israelis voted for uh, far-right parties. But the problem with that statement is that it's what sort of 10% voted for him. So Netanyahu needs 61 votes. His party only got 32 votes. So he has to cobble together 28 more votes in order to put together a governing coalition. So he has ultra-Orthodox parties, and he has a couple of other parties, it still doesn't get him in a majority. He needs to have these radical so-called 10%, or he forms no government. Now, when you are the final crux of a coalition and you are needed to get to the majority, you have a huge amount of leverage. And that's why you can demand to be the public security minister. Um, the, the other Smotrich he wants a big portfolio as well. So these portfolios are exercise a huge impact um, in Israeli society and have a huge impact on relations with the Palestinians. So um, it's it's totally a misnomer to try to argue that 
it's only 10%. Um, the other issue is that even though these may be 10%, what they do is they force the Israeli uh, discourse to their side. So if Israeli discourse is here, center, le- uh, you know, right wing, moderately white right wing, when the radical right wing uh, is over here, the center and the the center is over here, but they're so powerful in their discourse that they drag everybody else far to the right. So they have this ripple effect. It's not just their 10 percent, but it's the impact they have on everybody else. If you could, uh, could you speak to some of the activists and and types of people that are backing figures like Itamar ben Giver and um, Smote Rich? I know that you've uh, spoken about, I mean, there's even youths involved in these sort of really, you know, violent activities that Ben Gieber and Smote Rich, while I, I think they would publicly distance themselves from that. I mean, what, what I was getting at is, I know that there was a, a Hilltop youth activist that said that Ben Gieber was sort of pushing for incitement. Well, the Hilltop Youth actually, uh, Ben Ben Kvier actually runs the Hilltop Youth. Um, he doesn't have his fingerprints on it. He's never at a, a terror attack when one happens. Um, he's never publicly made a statement um, saying he's personally responsible. But um, uh, one of his former disciples who broke away from him did an interview on Israel's most popular TV news magazine. And she basically said, um, everybody, all of Ben Gvir's disciples know what he wants them to do. They know that he wants them to engage in terror attacks to provoke Palestinians. They know he wants to kill Palestinians. And he wants to burn down their uh, their their um, their orchards and their their agricultural lands. And so they do what they know he wants them to do. And once they've done what he wants them to do, they come back and they tell him what they've done. And he says. Great, what you've done is wonderful. Doesn't say it publicly, he says it privately. So he is a major inciter of all of this violence. And the woman who was interviewed said she went to the Israeli police and she explicitly told them about conversations that he has had where he has incited terror attacks or approved of them. And the police said, we can't touch him because he's a political entity and we can't. Uh, we can't do that. So, but the police are in cahoots with the right wing. Oh, the police themselves are right wing politically. The military itself, most of the troops and most of the commanders are far right uh, themselves. So you have a situation, you know, people don't like this analogy, but you have a situation that is very comparable to Nazi Germany and that sort of gradual movement uh, farther and farther, you know, you start with Hitler winning an election in 1933. A minority, he's a minority, but he eventually um, wins control of the government, and he moves things farther and farther till you end up uh, with genocide, and you end up with more. Um, I don't think Israel is going to do that on that scale because it's obviously a smaller state, but um, um, the level uh, and possibility of damage here is enormous. If you could, could you talk about some of the activities that, say, radical youth activists in Israel uh, engage in? Because I, I've heard a little bit about things like um, Israeli price tag attacks. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and any other activities, just to give a picture of what these radicals do. Well, one of the worst uh, recent ones, actually, it was a couple of years ago, was um, some of these hilltop youth activists uh, went out with Molotov cocktails and threw them into a home of a Palestinian family, which were a mother and father, an infant toddler, and a four-year-old uh, boy. Um, all of them, except for the toddler, died in the in the uh, fire. And um, Israel, I wrote about this because I have sources in Israel who told me who the perpetrators were. And there were at least four or five or six of them. And what what the Shin Bet does, the uh, domestic uh, intelligence agency is, even though they know all six, by the way, they thought they had one informer within the group and the informer turned against the Shin Bet and didn't tell the Shin Bet about the attack happening. But um, they only really went after one person 
in of all the five or six. They chose this person to be sort of like the uh, exemplar. Um, they punished this guy, and then they let all the others off. So you have an act of terrorism and murder, a horrific attack. Um, then following that up, they would have a wedding in the West Bank with these radical far-right terrorists, and they at the weddings they dance. And what they did is they took a picture of the baby who survived, and then they um, made a motion like they would were stabbing the baby um, in the midst of this frenzied, you know, religious dancing that they were doing. Um, horrific, horrendous stuff. I mean, this is the level of kind of not just fervor but frenzy. You know, I, I liken it to to um, you know the attack of wild beasts on 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 and um, on their victims. Um, it's it's you know people outside of Israel just don't have any, absolutely do not have any clue about what this is like. Um, there are places in the world where there are similar levers of hatred, like India between Hindus and Muslims, and the similar kinds of uh, frenzied you know violence, but. Um, we're, we're, another incident uh, that's important is that there is a famous church in the Galilee called um, the Church of Loaves and Fishes, which is supposed to be where um, uh, Jesus, um, I can't remember, I'm not up on my Christian uh, uh, biblical stories, but um, Jesus uh, turned something into loaves and fishes. And there's a beautiful um, church there at the site. And they uh, did an arson attack, and they almost destroyed the entire church. Um, and I don't even know if anybody was arrested or convicted. I think one person was. Of course, you can't do a terror attack like that without more. But again, like I said, they only pick one person, and they um, and they and they prosecute them. So the Hilltop Youth again, they may be a small minority within Israeli society, but they're the leading edge, the leading ideological edge. And, and we can liken it, I think, to um, the Trump era, because um, you have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and people like um, uh, Boebert from Colorado. These are kind of the ideological authors of um, MAGA. They're the ones driving the discourse. Um, and then you have figures that are in, you know, that are that are kind of in Congress or in the Senate who are going to implement this vision legislatively if they can, or they're going to go on the Supreme Court and they're going to destroy Roe v. Wade. Um, but the the Hilltop youth are the catalysts, the igniters of everything else that goes on in Israel related to the Palestinians. So they are key elements. And the state has no interest in rooting them out or destroying them or prosecuting them. That is what it would take if they really wanted to uh, affirm that they were going to be a democratic state. They have no will to do that. I guess the question on a lot of people's minds is, how did it get to this point where people like Itamar ben Giver, um, Smote Rich, uh, these type of activists are, are increasingly such a force. How do we get to this point, and and what role uh, did Netanyahu play in you know empowering these elements? Well, I think to, you have to go back um, to the very beginnings of the state, uh, 1948. Um, an act of uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide was committed against the Palestinians. Um, as the state was created, uh, Ben Gurion wanted to get rid of as many Palestinians as he could, and uh, they forced a million of them into exile. And they now live in four or five countries around the Middle East, and they're all refugees, and they have been for forty or fifty years. Um, so that sort of original sin is what I call it um, has informed everything that came since um, Israel until 1966 put the entire Israeli-Palestinian population under martial law from 1948 to 1966, almost 20 years of martial law. And um, in 1967, when Israel won the uh, what some people call the Six-Day War, um, they took over the West Bank and they exiled hundreds of thousands more Palestinians uh, in, in that war. And after 1967, it, 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 the victory was so complete on, on this part of Israel that this messy, the religious messianic movement arose that said, if we 
take control if we take back all of the land that King David uh, owned when he was king, going back to the last sort of major Israelite uh, dynasty or what you will, um, then the Messiah will come. And these people really believe in the Messiah. This is not a figure of speech or anything like that. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, Christians believe in their return of Jesus, but they're probably most Christians like see that as more of a, uh, a metaphor or some other thing like that and don't physically believe that he's going to be reincarnated. I'm, I'm sure a lot do, obviously, but the same tr is true of, of these fanatical Jews. Um, so, and, and one thing I, I've talked about quite a bit is I see a difference between politics and religion. In politics, you're basically trying to compromise so that you get what you want, not everything, and your opponent, your rival gets what they want, and you're obviously fighting back and forth for who's going to dominate, but ultimately there can be compromise. In religion, it's not that way at all, because if you believe that God is on your side and wants you to win, that belief is so completely absolute that you can't make you can't take into account any other religion or any other sort of ethnicity because they stand in the way of God's will. And if you have God on your side, like Dylan sang, then you're willing to do anything to achieve victory. And so these extremists believe in an ultimate war between Jews and Muslims because they believe Jews have to dominate uh, dominate this area in order for the Messiah to return. So they want to incite that. They, they don't want, you know, like in politics or in running a government, you want to achieve sort of security. You want to achieve calm. You don't want to have like major civil wars, whatever. That's not what they want. They want a civil war. They want to destroy the Palestinians. And they want to do that by any means necessary. I, I was going to add real quick. So things like these, I had mentioned uh, price tag attacks, which for people that don't know is like far right gra graffitiing of, um, I think it's even happened in neighborhoods in East Jerusalem now um, as of like 2020. Um, but it's, it's known for happening in the West Bank. Uh, so that type of vandalism has happened. Uh, there's also the nationalist, uh, Jerusalem Day marches where um, there's these nationalists yelling death to Arabs um, in these communities. Is this all about provoking a conflagration at the end of the day, these type of activities? Well, I think price tag attacks where they um, graffiti uh, Palestinian property and <clears throat> cars they light on fire, um, that's small potatoes. Um, that, that's just sort of engaging in petty, petty uh, vandalism and whatever. They have a much more fundamental view or, or, or agenda. And that is, they don't want to just um, destroy a little bit of property or harass a couple of Palestinian families. <clears throat> they want to do this on a national scale. They want to eliminate the Palestinian people by any means necessary. Like I said, expulsion, acts of violence, um, any other means that they can think of. And, and that would include a military conflict um, uh, in which Israel fights to the death um, with its Palestinian citizens inside uh, Israel and uh, with the Palestinians in their occupied territories and any Arab state that comes to their aid. So um, this is a global, not a global, but a regional vision. Well, it's, it has global stakes, actually, because of... Um, Muslims who live around the world who believe that Jerusalem is a sacred site for them. So there could be a, 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 a um, there could be a scenario in which some of these uh, Arab or Muslim states actually um, take the side of Palestine and um, intervene in some way in any sort of conflict like that. So what role did did Netanyahu play in? You know, I, I, I think he's actually sort of fed these uh, figures like Itamar ben Giver and Smote Rich. And now he really I don't think he can control them in a way. Uh, you know, the, the journalist Yossi Gervitz told me that, you know, what 
Netanyahu has done in a lot of ways is to ride a tiger that he can no longer control. Yeah. So if you go back to Nazi Germany in 1933, when Hitler won a minority, but he was the largest party in the uh, election, um, the president at the time was uh, von Hindenburg, a famous uh, German <clears throat> general from World War I. And he believed, too, that he could control Hitler, um, that if he appointed him prime minister, that um, that Hindenburg would retain some element of control. He didn't believe that Hitler was going to be a, uh, you know, a major figure that uh, Hitler would be able to achieve what he eventually achieved. And the problem was that Hindenburg was wrong. Hitler outsmarted him politically and in every way possible. And that led to 12 years of, of fascism and genocide. Um, so Netanyahu is obviously a wily politician. He's a politician. He's an excellent tactician. Um, but he and, and he is very good at manipulating people politically, personally, whatever. Um, so he thinks that he can control them. And he has done a pretty good job of controlling his rivals. Um, whenever anybody gets too much power, he dismisses them and gets rid of them. Um, and so he may think he can do that with them. But, um, you know, he, he has jumped on a tiger and, uh, you know, tiger, tigers can bite back against you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and the other part is that um, Netanyahu is a chameleon. He takes on the stripes of whatever environment he's in. So if he's in an environment with uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich, he will um, take on their 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 coloring and become even more fascist than he uh, than he and he has been. And one other thing that's interesting about Netanyahu is that there's a famous interview where he goes into the home of a group of settlers and he starts talking to them about. Um, Israel's relationship with the world and the settlers tend to be very paranoid and say the world is against us. And so they're talking about why the United States, uh, you know, opposes settlements, et cetera. And, ben, and, ben, and Netanyahu says to them, don't worry about the United States. I have the United States wrapped around my little finger. That is what the guy thinks of himself. He thinks he is a master manipulator of people and nations. And there is going to come a point when He's going to find that he's, um, you know, he he's he doesn't have control of the tiger anymore, and the tiger's going to turn around and turn on them. So, uh, before we start closing out, I guess just a, a few more questions here. I know you mentioned the the term you used the term Judeo fascism, and um, I, I know a lot of Americans right now are concerned about these, you know, anti Semitic outbursts that figures like Kanye West or. Um, Kyrie Irving had. So I think we're in a moment where people are, uh, you know, almost, I guess, they're very apprehensive about using terms like that. Um, I had an Israeli guest who referred to um, Itamar Ben Giver as essentially uh, a Jewish supremacist. And I, I think a lot of people um, scoff at that because they're seeing, uh, I think, very legitimate claims of, of anti-Semitism happening in the U.S. So how do we walk this tightrope of really dealing with anti-Semitism here in the U.S. while also being able to speak honestly and and truthfully about uh, what's happening in Israel. I just wanted your thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm a Jew who's um, in my past been observant and come out of uh, uh, the organized Jewish community and mainstream community. Um, I'm, I'm a dissident now, and I'm quite left-wing, obviously, um, and critical of Israel. So I know that I know the community. I know the uh, um, the paranoia and the fear that the community has, um, and I'm also able to balance it with what I consider to be real world conditions. So, Jews, American Jews, Israelis have the trauma of the Holocaust, the trauma of Jewish suffering over the ages, um, going back many centuries, and um, that not only informs their point of view. It it uh, becomes an obsession almost and, and a projection of what they think will happen. So many people honestly or maybe dishonestly um, are projecting that the Jews are, are have um, eternal enemies, that w the Jews are eternally persecuted and that the world is out to get us. And 
Um, there have been instances, obviously, in the Holocaust where that was true, um, and instances before that, um, going back to the Spanish Inquisition and Roman conquest. So there is a there is a pattern and a history of that, but we have to also acknowledge that that isn't always the case. That today is not Nazi Germany in 1938, which is a slogan that uh, Bibi Netanyahu likes to use. Um, but it's 2022, and Israel is one of the most powerful, as one of the most powerful in, in, in militaries in the world. It is not uh, European Jewry in 1938, you know, which had no way of defending itself. Um, and and we have to acknowledge that Israel actually is more of a danger to world Jewry than um, than any enemy, uh, because the reason is that Israel presumes to speak on behalf of world Jewry, but its actions are anti-Jewish, in my opinion. The actions of, of the Jews of Israel, many of them, um, violate Jewish precepts. Judaism is not a religion of conquest. It's not a religion of, uh, of, of the worship of, uh, I call it stones and bones. It's not a worship of land, of territory. It's, it's values, it's traditions, it's ethics. It's the biblical prophets talking about peace and justice and, and, and supporting the poor. Um, it's not about conquest. It's not about owning a land. It's not about stealing water resources and all, all this other stuff. And again, this is the policy of a state and of a government, not of a religion. And those people who talk about anti-Semitism in the way that they have, and they try to associate criticism, criticism of, of Israel with anti-Semitism, are doing a major disservice because they're formulating this as if Israel is, in, a, in effect, Judaism. And they're, they're saying that any statement that attacks Israel is anti-Semitic. Well, anti what is anti-Semitism? It's not anything to do with Israel. It has to do with Jews. It has to do with the way Jews are treated by non-Jews. So if you hate Jews, you're an anti-Semite. If you criticize Israel, are you an anti-Semite? No, you're critical of a state. There must be a distinction between the two. And it's one of the reasons why I argue that, that Israeli Judaism, in quotes, it's, it's not Judaism as we've known it for hundreds of years. It's a deformed version of Judaism. And that's why I don't use the term Jewish when I talk about supremacy or fascism. I use the term Judeo-fascism, Judeo-supremacy, because I don't want to use that legitimate term of Jewish because I don't feel that their Judaism is legitimate. It's an aberration. Not, not to interrupt you, but it's almost like this ideology that's been promoted by figures like the late Mir Kahani it's, it's almost like a perversion of, of Jewish traditions. Yeah. I mean, he was a rabbi, obviously. He had, had pretenses of, you know, being a major sort of religious spiritual figure. Um, but if you recall, going back to the 1960s, he was considered to be a lunatic by most people. He threw bombs at Russian consulates, um, engaged in all sorts of sort of wild and weird attacks and verbal attacks. And he had statements like every Jew with a 22. People might not remember there were 22 caliber guns in those days. Um, his, his slogan, never again, came. That was his slogan. Now it's been adopted sort of by everyone. Um, Mayor Kahana won a posthumous victory in this election. This Israeli state is now a Kahana state. Kahana started out as a a minor extremist figure when he moved to Israel. And by the way, he moved to Israel because the United States told him, we, we're going to prosecute you as a terrorist. Yeah, so he knew even, he had to. I was going to say there ahead. were even figures in, in the American Jewish community at the time when he was here in the U.S. that, you know, just thought he was poison. Yeah. Yeah. And they ostracized him and they didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, and when he went to Israel, he founded a party which the U.S. deemed a terrorist party and deemed Kahana terrorism, terrorist. Um, and and uh, in Israel, in 1988, when he ran, the Israeli state uh, ruled him to be a terrorist and said, you can't run, your party can't run. So 
he at, at that point in Israel, there was a dividing line. There was a red line that they weren't willing to cross. And Kahana would have been a bridge too far. Now, Kahana informs everything to do with politics, uh, social discourse. It's all Kahanist. Um, the, people won't say that word, maybe, um, and they don't speak in those terms. But Israel is Mayor Kahana this today. And I, I think it's important to note again that, I mean, the shocking part of this election for a lot of people, and it's been covered, it, of course, in the U.S. media, is that, you know, th these figures like Ben Giver and, and Smotrich, they've doubled their, their vote total from the last round. So this is an ascendant form of ideology in Israel. Yeah, um, this is the most popular, the most uh, successful that they've ever been. The, the flip side of that is important to note as well. Israel has always had uh, two factions on the left. There's the Zionist left, which are mostly Israeli Jews. And they uh, they go back, their tradition goes back to the kibbutz movement. It goes back to sort of socialism uh, of the earliest part of the, uh, of the Israeli state. Um, the welfare state where they provided huge levels of social welfare support to the poor, um, that left has been decimated over the years. Um, the Labor Party used to be the dominant uh, party in Israel up to 1977, and now they barely got into the Knesset. And the Meretz Party, which is the Zionist left, didn't get in at all. So it means that the sort of center left had like four to six, eight seats in, out of 120. The other element of the of the left is the Palestinian left, and they formed a joint list uh, for the last few elections, four, four Palestinian parties together, and uh, the last election they won 15 seats. They had a fracture uh, between them, amongst them, and one or two of the parties left and, and went out on their own, and two parties stayed together. The two parties that stayed together um, got something like eight seats. Um, the other party that fractured away from them failed to pass the threshold. So you have um, the eight seats of the Zionist left diminished to four. You had the 15 seats of the joint lift dim list diminished to eight. So the left disintegrated. So there's no opposition. There's, you know, they used to call the former government, the, 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 the one that um, uh, defeated that replaced Netanyahu for a year or two, they used to call it a center-left government. That's a total misnomer. It was a center-right government at best. Um, and it was Bibi light, basically. Um, and the only opposition, real leftist progressive opposition, was those two sort of minor parties, one Jewish, one Palestinian, and they offer no resistance. Um, so the entire Knesset is now goes from right to farthest right. Just two more things here. Uh, so with the disintegration of the left in Israel, is there a perverse silver lining in that, in the sense that you know people can't keep saying, uh, you know, well, there, there's still this Israeli left uh, because it seems like it's becoming less and less of a force. So what effect does that have on maybe um, our perceptions of what is happening in Israel and Palestine? I, uh, along with a lot of people, have a um, kind of ambivalent view of what's going on, because on the one hand, as someone who once was a liberal Zionist and once sort of believed in uh, the liberal, humane, um, social democratic uh, view of Israel um, and who transformed over the years as Israel became more right wing, I became more you know, left wing. Um, so th there's this view, uh, in my older self or younger self, um, believing that Israel could eventually become a progressive state if only we worked hard enough at it, if only we persuaded people to vote the right way. That's gone. I mean, that's dead. Uh, but still, it lingers in your mind like you don't want Israel to go down this path. Um, you don't want it to sort of become enmeshed in fascism. Um, but the other part of me believes that that's the direction Israel is taking. There's no way of stopping it. So what do you want to happen? Well, a lot of people 
say, this is good. This is actually good because then the, re the rest of the world will no longer be able to say Israel can perfect itself. Israel can eventually become, you know, all we have to do is persuade, whatever. Um, and also a lot of the world sort of says, well, Israel is a democracy and the, and the, the people voted and we have to sort of accept what the people said. And, and what they don't realize is if you don't stand up to fascism when it's in its infancy, if you don't strangle the fascist baby in the cradle, the baby will grow up and become an adult. And then you can't deal with it. The same thing happened with Hitler. There was a chance, there was an international boycott in the early 1930s that was, that was founded by American Jews that said, if we boycott Germany, they will not have the funds to rebuild their military. They will not have the funds to do what they eventually did. They need to do the same thing now. And if they don't, this is you know what, what history will, will repeat itself. So what is going to happen is that BDS is going to be strengthened. The boycott divestment sanctions movement is going to be stra strengthened because what alternative is there? BDS is the best alternative because it's nonviolent, but it also retains true progressive values. It calls for a right of return of Palestinians who were expelled. It calls for making Israel a fully democratic state with equal rights for all its citizens. Um, and it calls for Jerusalem to be uh, a state for, uh, they call, it doesn't call for a single state solution. But essentially, the principles would lead in that direction. And that's the only just way to approach this. And so if you support a single secular state that includes Jews and, and, and Muslims, Palestinians and Israelis together, the only way to get there is by a single state. The two-state solution that all the governments in the world, like the United States, the UK, uh, two-state solution, you know, you hear Biden say, I want a, a Palestinian state. That's I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this word on your uh, podcast, but that's bullshit. Um, the two, two states is dead. You know, they 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 killed the, they they killed it and it put it in its coffin and they buried it. Do Whether you think, they real real quick, yeah. not to interrupt, but do you think people like Ben Gieber almost? Um, I know this is speculative, but it's almost like maybe he uh, figures like him intuitively understand that because it seems like now we're left with these options. The two state is dead. We're left with either the one state solution or the 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 Israeli far right's solution, which seems to be ethnic cleansing. Yeah, um, they want to um, manipulate the situation so that there's no sort of there's no realistic sort of compromise possible. They 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 kill the two state solution. And they don't accept the possibility of a Palestinian state. And um, the, the rest of the world sort of is, is um, keeping a distance from that and not acknowledging that that's what's going on. And that's exactly what the far right wants. They want to keep at bay the, the outside world while they can do their, um, their worst inside Israel. And um, the world better wake up is all I can say. The, you know, people are talking about how the United States is going to approach this. They're talking about, well, we won't meet with Bissal el Smotris. We won't meet with Ben Gvir. That's not enough. You have to make a statement that not only will you not meet with them, they are persona non grata. They cannot come into this country. We will not deal with them. And we will make the government of Israel pay if it makes them senior uh, members of the government. And that's what it will take. And the world, the governments of the world do not have the stomach to do what they need to do to stop fascism. That's actually what I was going to ask you. Do, you. do you think this will affect, uh, you know, a, a lot of U.S. And, and even politicians in Britain uh, will talk about the unbreakable bond uh, between Israel and their countries. At the same time, it seems like they're having trouble dealing with uh, the ascendancy of figures like Itamar ben Giver. So, I, I mean, is there going to have to be a breaking point at some point? And also, I I mean, was was I overstating things, saying that uh, ben Giver and these other figures essentially want ethnic cleansing? No, you're not overstating at all. I mean, not just ethnic cleansing. They want actually, they want a decisive war, uh, which I mentioned a couple of times. 
But let's talk about um, let's talk about the impact that this has on U.S. politics, because we have a progressive wing of the Democratic Party, the Squad, Bernie Sanders. Um, they, over the past four or five years, have made a huge dent into um, the Democratic mainstream. Um, gotten elected to Congress. We're talking about Rashida Tlaib. We're talking about Ilan Omar. We're talking about um, 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 Jamal Bowman um, in New York. And um, they had huge victories that were unprecedented. And there's been a backlash against that, that APEC, the, uh, the prime Israel lobby group, uh, has spent $40, $50 million, both to attack progressive Democrats in primaries and support moderate Democrats against them. And now, for example, Summer Lee in Pennsylvania, they've spent already $2 million to uh, defeat her. Um, and so they are um, spending at least 30 or $40 million, I believe, in this election cycle. Um, but what's happening in Israel has an impact on that. The Israel lobby cannot, you know, they can spend a lot of money and whatever their money does, it has an impact politically, obviously. But the events are shaped by Israel. The events that happen in Israel have an impact over here. You can say that, you know, the lobby will keep a sort of, a, you know, a fence around uh, the support for Israel in the United States. It won't be impacted by what's going on in Israel. But that's not true. And if you look at surveys of American Jewish opinion and American opinion in general, support for Israel goes down, especially when there are wars in Gaza and things like that, and support for Palestinian goes up. It's still not comparable, but it's on a downward trajectory. Um, and especially among the young people, among uh, American Jewish young people, have much lower levels of support for Israel than the older generation. And the older generation, which includes me, uh, although I'm you know, have a different perspective than many of uh, my peers. Um, the younger generation is going to be the one um, that that uh, has the future in in stock, and um, there won't be that kind of support. Now, what Israel does, anticipating that that's now anticipating that he basically gives up on American Jewry. The only parts of American Jewry, Jewry he wants to deal with are the Israel lobby. And he turns to the Christian evangelical movement because they are not only right wing because they believe in this biblical vision of um, in order for the Messiah to come for Jesus to return. There has to be this uh, Armageddon, this war between Gog and Magog, um, and that after that war, when many Jews, millions of Jews are going to be um, destroyed, everybody is going to convert to Christianity and Jesus returns. So. The Christian evangelical movement is perfect for Israel because it needs Israel to return to the biblical uh, boundaries, and um, and they don't question Israel. They don't have any criticism of Israel. Everything Israel does is, uh, you know, towards that uh, messianic vision. So um, that's also a really pernicious, uh, you know, for for decades, Israel has relied on the American Jewish community. And the, that community has given them unstinting support, has hardly criticized. And now it's changing. And now there's a division between Jews in Israel and in the United States. And that's not good in the long term. Do you think there will be any uh, change in U.S. policy in the coming years when it comes to Israel? Because I know you said it's not enough to say we're not going to work with uh, Smotrich uh, or Ben Giver, but that does seem like it does mean something uh, that we're currently having, um, you know, just I, I saw the report in Axios a few days ago that apparently the Biden administration are saying, you know, we, we can't work with with someone like uh, Ben Gieber. Um, Is that a game changer in any way or uh, like, do, do you see any change in U.S. policy towards Israel happening in the future? No. And I'll tell you the reason <clears throat> that for Biden, the Middle East is a, a zero sum game. Um, Obama was involved in trying to figure out something and presidents before put lots of initiatives and, and energy into it. And he realizes I'm not going to be able to make the impact that the U.S. would like. So if I can't make a contribution to resolve things, I'm going to pay attention elsewhere in the world, China and, and Asia. 
uh, Russia and Ukraine. Those are the areas where he's going to devote more attention. Um, he's not going to invest any sort of uh, political capital in trying to negotiate the, the, between the Israel and the Palestinians. He's just not going to do it. So, I mean, he hasn't he, he, he in the campaign, he said, I will re recognize the Palestinian consulate in D.C. I will move the uh, Israeli embassy back from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. He hasn't done any of those things. So he's abandoned any real interest in uh, doing any sort of uh, progressive or or pragmatic approach to this. So what that's going to do is create a vacuum in uh, U.S. politics. And, and right now you have Bernie Sanders in the last election said we need to uh, restrict U.S. aid to Israel to the extent that it obeys international law. Um, and that's what the progressives in Congress are demanding. And the progressives actually stopped a $500 million military appropriation in Congress that eventually was passed, but the first time it was voted on, they defeated it. So this is a small incremental process that's going to be happening. There's not going to be a revolution in, in, in perceptions of Israel. But as Israel escalates, the outrage of, of their actions is going to eventually lead to a similar escalation of criticism and, and opposition to Israel. And the Israel lobby will become less powerful, despite its tens of millions. And... Um, it will exert less and less control over the political system. What's the relationship, I guess, between the Western far right and this Israeli far right? Because I think there are, um, you know, despite the the Western far right's anti-Semitism, there is almost these points of agreement that they probably have with figures like Ben Kiefer. You know, the the viciously anti-LGBTQ sort of views of the far right in the U.S. I think they can be mirrored at times in the Israeli far right, and uh, also just the the hatred of um, Muslims that the Western far right has. Uh, are there parallels to be made between these two groups? Absolutely. And um, um, what you have to do is look to the uh, Euro right. Um, Italy has a new uh, prime minister who is far right, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, illiberal democracy, that's his tagline. A Poland the Law and Justice Party is far right, sort of a Catholic fundamentalist. Uh, and, and Orban has talked about uh, a Christian bulwark against the Muslim hordes. Um, and Israel, the far right, and, and Netanyahu himself has made alliances with those, with those groups. He's made visits to, um, to Hungary. And Orban has come to, to Israel. Now, Orban is anti-Semitic. He's explicitly anti-Semitic. He's attacked George Soros in terms that the Nazis used to attack the Jewish financiers, which control the global financial system. You know, um, and Orban went to Yad Vashem and went to the Holocaust Museum, even though he's an avowed anti-Semite who worships Admiral Horthy, who was the first Hungarian leader who was a Hungarian Nazi. So. This is the most bizarre thing that you can imagine. Now, to explain it, you have to understand that the far right in Europe believes that Israel is an ally because it's the bulwark itself of Jews against Muslims. Um, and so there is this unity in hatred of Muslims, hatred of refugees, hatred of African refugees, hatred of you know minorities and black people around the world and, and Muslims. So. Um, that's and, and the other flip side of this is that these anti-Semites amongst all of these countries love Israel, hate Jews. Now, how to explain that is that Jews in the diaspora are largely liberal and progressive. And they don't support Islamophobia and they don't support, um, you know, wanting to stop the refugees at the gate like Trump did or wanted to. Um, they're a liberal force and they, the fascists in the, around the world, the Nazis around the world hate that. They hate liberalism they, and, they, and the Jews for them represent liberalism, just like for the Nazis, Jews were Bolsheviks and radicals and whatever, and they had to be exterminated. So. That's how they make this weird distinction between Jews and Israel. It's almost for them Israel isn't 
Jewish in that sense. Um, if you go back to Richard Spencer, who we don't hear about too much anymore, but he was a leader of the white supremacists in Charlottesville and whatever, he went to Israel and he praised Israel for being a Jewish ethnostate because he wants a white ethnostate. So that's the kind of model that the far right looks to Israel to implement. And on the other hand, Israel, the far right in Israel adopt what they learn from the far right in Europe or in the United States. So there is this sort of um, back and forth between the two and they all learn from each other and they perfect the ideology, they perfect the uh, political strategies um, which lead to their greater success. In closing, you know, it sounds like right now, even though there's a lot of um, signaled concern, even from U.S. officials and even media people, uh, like I, I saw that Thomas Friedman uh, was very upset about the elections. And Thomas Friedman, I think, um, isn't exactly uh, some anti-Israel figure. Uh, I mean, he's writing for The New York Times and he's um, very mainstream. But it sounds like as much as people are, are voicing this concern about the ascendancy of the far right in Israel, it doesn't sound like we're necessarily going to act on that concern and, and dealing with this issue yet. At least uh, the, the Western nations aren't going to uh, deal with it head on. Well, I call it <clears throat> performative uh, concern, like when the uh, U.S. And, and U.K. talk about shared values and they say that uh, the relations between the two transcend politics because they're based in shared values. That is all complete horseshit because every relationship between a, one country and another is based on politics. Relationships are very rarely based purely on shared values. You want to talk about maybe England and the United States because you know we were a colony of England and our values, our justice system, uh, and our electoral system all have you know influenced each other. Especially England influenced the United States, so you could say that there's shared values in that context and there's history. Um, but what kind of values do we share with Israel? What that we we support apartheid, we support ethnic cleansing. Oh, and, and what are you going to say, that we support Israeli democracy? Well, what kind of democracy is this? Lots of countries have elections, but that doesn't make them democratic. It, democracy is much bigger than an election. So to focus on election or on 10 percent or whatever, that's completely misses the point um, uh, of what we're talking about. So that's why governments are not meeting their moral obligation here. They're refusing to see what is right before their eyes. And that's a lot of what, if you look at Neville Chamberlain um, negotiating, coming back from negotiating with Hitler and you know saying that he's achieved peace in our time, when actually what he did was he, he, um, he capitulated to Hitler. And that's what led to what, what came after. So we are right now, in effect, capitulating to Israeli fascism uh, by ignoring it, by not taking a full throated stand against it. And that's going to come back and bite us in the ass in the future, because if we don't stand up now, we're going to have 10 times, 100 times worse situation uh, down the line. But is there anything, I guess, for people like us who care about these issues? I mean, are we just, it feels like in a lot of ways, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic, but uh, it, it, I, I'm assuming for you, it can feel very powerless at times. So what, what what are we supposed to do going forward, those of us who do care about this issue? Well, um, support candidates like um, the ones I mentioned, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, um, and push them and push the ones that are not good. Um, uh, Democrats that that are you know in in uh, cahoots with the Israel lobby or or under the sort of thumb of the Israel lobby have to get rid of those candidates. You have to say to them, either you change your position or we vote against you or we put up a primary opponent against you, and we start raising money that will um, that will uh, sort of balance out the money that's spent by the Israel lobby. Um, and, and we just have to try to build a progressive movement that, um, and even within the progressive movement, within DSA, within groups like that, we have to keep this progressive point of view on Israel as much in the public eye as we can. That's why I do as many of these interviews as I can. Uh, it's why I write what I do. It's why I publish uh, uh, the way that I do, 
because I want these ideas to be uh, disseminated and distributed as widely as possible. And I want them to even incrementally change people's point of view so that you can have a candidate like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who speaks relatively and, and strongly about um, Israel-Palestine, although she too um, falls under this spell where she has to compromise uh, in some of these ways. And sometimes when you hear her doing interviews, gets sidetracked and, and uh, doesn't sort of have a very clear, consistent point of view, and she tries to compromise. Uh, Bernie Sanders is another example. He is very uh, kind of astute in, 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 or, or compromises and realizes I can only go so far. I'm not in favor of BDS. I'm only in favor of having the right of BDS to speak. Um, those are kind of um, um, half-baked uh, progressive positions. And so we, we want to pressure Sanders to keep moving uh, in, in a leftward direction on Israel-Palestine, um, because that's the only hope that we have of we have to change U.S. policy. We have to get a presidential candidate who's willing to be as progressive or more progressive than Bernie Sanders. And we have to give them cover when they take these positions. For example, Mark Ruffalo, has, the actor, has made many pro-Palestinian uh, and critical uh, comments critical of Israel, and he's gotten huge backlash from the Israel lobby and on social media platforms. Well, we have to support people like Mark Ruffalo because they're speaking the truth. The truth. Um, they are reflecting what the reality is. And we can't let them be bullied. We can't let uh, these political progressives uh, be bullied by the lobby or be intimidated by 40 or $50 million being spent on a campaign to oust them. Um, we have to make it so that the Israel lobby is as uncomfortable as possible diminished as possible um, as a political force in American political discourse. Well, Richard Silverstein, I want to thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. And my listeners can read your work at richardsilverstein.com, uh, which is where your blog, Tikan uh, Olam, is. Uh, thank you again, Richard Silverstein. Thanks again. I appreciate being on with you. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you found my conversation with Tikkun Olam's Richard Silverstein to be informative and enlightening. As always, if you appreciate the work here I do at Parallax Views, please, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said... Until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say don't do it, just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing it like great. So you know we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff, it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.